All that means is that I intend to be a broker between providers and users of information. So that information is what we need to develop business and, develop and, and deliver services faster, better, and cheaper. So I leave you with this thought as we do the transformation of flagships and Hawaii Broadband Initiative is one of our four key flagships of the administration. So why can't Hawaii be the next Singapore? I ask you this question. If Singapore has planned that and they can have one city country basically can have this incredible planning with five million people and everything just works lickety split, that's a technical term. Uh, so why can't we do that in Hawaii? We got much more resources and much more capability. We gotta focus on that. And why can't we be the best digital state in the damn union? Why can't we do that? We can. I think if we get together, that's what we need. Thank you very much. Okay, well now it's my great pleasure to introduce your co-host for today, a digital media guru, a TV producer on OC16, a radio talk show host, a corporate lawyer. What more can I bring you other than my good friend, Jay Fidel? Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Sonny. So now we're going to make Hawaii the best in the, in the world. Yes, in the world. Yes, okay, at this point, uh, despite the advice of the contrary, I want to take one minute, okay? And I'd like you guys to talk to each other, network, and I'd like you to deal with three questions. The first is, what are you getting up? What are you getting down? Okay? On, on the, on the, uh, on the broad, uh, broadband. And, the, and the, the next question is, what is, what is the guy next to you going to do to make this happen? Okay? One minute. One minute. Opportunity and see what you really have. It's HawaiiSpeedTest.net, okay? And it's a uh, it's, it's it's impartial. It's uh, not biased, and then it will give you as accurate as you can get. And once you take a look at that and see what you have, it may it may shock you. Um, how have we lost our advantage over the last decade? We used to be relatively speaking one of the fastest places in the world. We're no longer that way. A current market and appetite for speed and access we should examine. Uh, how a move to greater speed and access will affect and benefit our communities we should examine. Uh, a lot of people, you know, we did we did 50 interviews um, about broadband and attitudes toward broadband, and we, we found a lot of people had no idea exactly relatively how fast or slow they were getting. Uh, and they had no idea about exactly what they would do with the additional speed that, uh, that gigabit uh, speed would, would afford them. Um, and that's public education. Uh, and we have to show them that there's more out there that they could do. Some people have a kind of semi-realization. One of the things that I learned, and I learned it from a Jason Lau a filmmaker, is that if you want to make Hawaii, for example, a filmmaking community, and we're going to do a program about this in July, um, and you, you need to pass video files everywhere in the world quick. And if you look at uh, ProRes 422 as one of the encoding devices, encoding formats, uh, that will give you 60 gigabytes for an hour. Okay, a 60 gigabyte file is going to take a long time to pass to Singapore, if you like. Okay, so we'd better speed it up. We don't realize how little we can do with what we have. 
I mean, there are people sending pouches. They're sending tribes in pouches all over the world through the airport. We could do this from our desk in our skivvies without having to stand up. This is what we need to do. Okay, so the question is, what are our speakers going to really talk about today? We told them, please be candid. Tell us the stuff we don't know. And I think we're going to, we're going to hear that. It's going to be a great, delightful surprise. Uh, that we're going to find out stuff about broadband here today we don't know. This is not same old. Uh, we are really on the cusp of something, <laughs> and it's very important uh, that we give them free reign. So I know Yuka is going to motivate them to do that. Oh, exciting. Okay. Um, so what are the cost? Big question. One of the people we talked to uh, said, you know, we're not talking hundreds of millions, we're talking billions to really get to every village and hamlet in the state and give them gigabit uh, broadband. Who will pay that cost, you know? Somebody said, well, you guys are just uh, out here pitching for government money. Oh, I don't think that's true at all. Uh, I don't think that this is a pitch for government money. This is a pitch for cooperation. Uh, and that's what we have to, so that's why I asked you to look to the left and look to the right. What are those guys going to do to make this happen? If everybody says, well, somebody else will handle it, it won't get handled. At the end of the day, broadband is going to be at the heart of our economy and our community. And we have to get by any complacency. We have to get by the policy issues and the challenges. We have to address them maybe here today. We um, like it or not, it's going to affect all of us where we live, work, play, and learn. What are we going to do about it? So Yuka Nagashima, CEO of the High Tech Development Corp, will moderate our panel, which includes David Lasner of the University of Hawaii, Brett Lewis of Blue Street Broadband, uh, Clifford Miyaki of TW Telecom of Hawaii, Nam Hu of Shakanet, Kimen Wang of Oceanic Time Warner Cable, uh, and Eric Yeaman of Hawaiian Telecom. So see the program sheet for more about them. And I want to remind them now that when they start their comments, they should start with the one word that best describes what they are going to tell you here today. And at the end of the hour, they'll have one minute to wrap up and rebut whatever they like. And at that time, they ought to tell us whether the word they gave you at the beginning is the same word they would give you at the end. And if they want to change their words, they're free to do so. Okay? On the discussion, we introduce Yuka Nagashima, CEO of the High Tech Development Corporation. I'll leave it to her to introduce the coverage of the panel and the six panelists. How about a warm welcome for Yuka? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. It's great to see familiar faces here. Um, since the, the introducers covered most of, and the, the speaker, keynote speaker covered most of the highlights, I just wanted to reiterate the governor's initiative. Uh, the High, uh, Hawaii Broadband Initiative is one gigabit by 2018, ubiquitously available at affordable rates. And for the techies out there, the one gigabit, it's symmetric, both up and down, because that's what we need to have. I also wanted to give you a, a plug for the social media club. The president of the social media club is here, Tara. And she has volunteered to live stream this event, uh, which is our goal for this, uh, the topic of the, of the meeting. And the hashtag for today is 808speed. So please, I encourage you to tweet what's being said. It's hashtag 808speed. So, and I also wanted to let you know that there was a Google uh, initiative uh, maybe a year ago or so where they were having each region and uh, cities and counties compete for their fiber to the home. How many of you have, have remember that competition? Hawaii did submit an application. We didn't win. However, what we learned from, um, from putting together the application is that this community is capable of coming together, even in telecommunications infrastructure where the competition is fierce. And so we put together a Facebook page, Hekui and others uh, who led that initiative. It's called Gigabit Hawaii. If you haven't liked that Facebook page, please do so. It will help us to uh, give you status updates of the initiative as well as show the community that we are one, we are together, we can do it, we want to do it. So that the Facebook page is Gigabit Hawaii. How many of you are already like the page, by the way? Right, so more to go. Uh, we currently have 9,000, over 9,500 people in the community liking it. And, uh, and there are people from all walks of life, students, parents, educators. Uh, so hopefully you can join that group. U.S. 
I, I believe the innovation is correlated to the broadband speeds. And both innovation and the broadband speeds for US has gone down. We used to rank 11th in the international scene. We're now 17th. Uh, last I checked, Hawaii was ranking within the US uh, 31st in the nation. And as you know, we were the, the state that boldly put forth the aloha.net, uh, which is the precursor to the internet and protocol. And, uh, and now we're 31st in the nation. So with that sort of framework, I'm going to introduce uh, the panel. The panelists will introduce themselves in terms of what their uh, background is so that they can uh, frame their uh, questions and uh, their answers or their uh, remarks. And they'll have five minutes or so, give or take, uh, to make their points, and then we'll, we'll open up the questions. Thank you, David, if you could start. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm David Lasser at the University of Hawaii. This was billed as a provider panel, and I am not a provider. Um, I had the good fun of chairing the Hawaii Broadcast Network, and that's kind of how I got sucked into this, and that's how I um, formed my opinions, which I will share with you now. So uh, five minutes is a tough assignment. Um, I'm going to take it as a given that broadband is important, transformative to education, economic development, uh, innovation, healthcare, good government, civic engagement, and all that. And we can argue or have questions later on if that's of interest. Um, I think where I will jump off the ranch a little bit, um, I'll say two things about our competitiveness. One is I actually think Hawaii does pretty well for the, most of the U.S. I've seen those numbers fluctuate depending on which metric you follow. At one point, we were 49th or 50th. Another study came out and said we were fastest growing. I mean, we're actually one in something. So um, in general, I think the services that we get from a couple of really strong companies that serve the consumer market is on a par with what most of the country can get. And in fact, most of our state can get those services, and by that I mean um, DSL and cable modem services. We're in pretty good shape, actually. What worries me is that our entire country is losing its competitiveness. And Hawaii is a part of that. So where we're sort of creeping up from seven, eight, nine megabits per second, I guess our high end right now for consumers is 50, the wideband service from, um, from Keeman will say a little bit about. Um, and I tested mine, I get 50 megabits up and down to their, uh, so good job. Oh, no, no, plus down. Um, but, but, um, but that is the, well, so let me compare that to the leading countries and what I would say the leading communities in our country. So they are targeting gigabit. I was thrilled when our governor, who was, by the way, the first governor to announce that as a goal for a state the first governor in the country to, to set that goal. Um, I was absolutely thrilled. And the reason I was thrilled is I honestly believe it'll take us that long to figure out how to get there and to get there. But we've got to start now. So this is um, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Um, and I hope we can pitch that vision that it's worthwhile. Because the how to get there is going to be really difficult. The reason I say that is the places that have are getting there or have gotten there have different models. So they basically have decided as a community, as a nation, Singapore for example, this is critical infrastructure for our nation. Or uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, this is critical infrastructure for our community. Uh, Australia, huge country, critical infrastructure for the nation. In fact, their election hinged on a commitment to their national broadband network. And what they have done is once they made this decision, that it's critical infrastructure, they made the investment. Mix of public and private, in almost no case, in very few cases, is the government actually running the network. But it was a matter of public policy to say, we need to get there and then work through the strategy. Sometimes it's been built with government money and then uh, services sold by competitive ISPs. 
Sometimes it's the utility in some U.S. communities, the electrical utility, wherever you guys are. Um, so there's there are ways of doing this, and, and I guess um, I'm down to my last minute or two. I'd say if we want to do this, um, we need to first decide we want to do it, and then something has to change. And in this country and in this state, we view this as a purely competitive market, and every one of these good souls has as their job, and they have to, legally, they are bound to maximize the return of value to their owners and shareholders. Nothing wrong with that. That's the playing field that we set up for broadband in the U.S., and they play it, and they play it well. If we want something different to happen than what is happening now, we collectively have to change that playing field. And that's what has happened in the places that are succeeding. Thanks. Just one word, <laughs> Infrastructure. <laughs> I'm Cliff Miyake. I'm with GW Telecom Hawaii. I know uh, we're not a household word for you all, but hopefully after the information sharing, maybe by tonight, my might be a household word. <laughs> <laughs> my one word is maybe, but I'll save my last minute to explain what I mean by maybe. Um, when I was in discussions of what something that would be valuable that I could share, I guess one of the things that's really not known about our company is that we do a lot of trans-Pacific bandwidth connectivity for a lot of entities in Hawaii. Right now we're running, by the end of this month, we'll be running 100 gigabits for folks, 10 to 10 gigabit connections for businesses, agencies, different entities. By the end of July, we'll be running 120 gigabits. And we've seen this growth happening uh, 10 gigabit clips every quarter we were adding 10 gig pipes across the water for someone. Um, our company started as a carrier's carrier, so that was our business, uh, getting, making bandwidth and making the paths available for folks who needed it to happen, and we continue to do that. So I did some research um, on what's available to get broadband in and out of the state of Hawaii, and this is what I found. So the three main systems are the Japan US system, the AAG system and Southern Cross going east to, to the continental United States. Right now, those three systems will give you up to, if they're full, fully utilized, it's about 4.3 terabits of data is the throughput. All three are in the process of upgrading. Right now, each uh, fiber pair, they're able to run 16 light waves on them. And they're running 10 gigs per light wave. They're in the process of upgrading their systems to be able to do 40 gigabits per light wave. So at the end of their upgrades, which should happen by the end of the year, all those entities will be able to uh, the state 14.25 terabits of connectivity to the mainland. Now going west, uh, we're at about 2.1 terabits of capacity to Asia and Japan. Uh, some of these systems are also being upgraded, and at the end, they should be getting us closer to 10 terabytes of connectivity. And then we have about one, two, about three terabytes down to Australia via uh, either Telstra's Endeavor system or Southern Cross. So the other thing I wanted to bring up is building a new system. We often ask why, what is the difficulty getting a new system into Hawaii? There's a lot of issues, one of them is cost. Currently, I think the number, if you were to try and build a new fiber system, you're looking at about a 200 to $250 million investment to get from Hawaii to the West Coast. Um, there is another system, I've talked to some folks, they want to come in from Asia to Guam, to Hawaii, and then to the coast with a branching unit connecting Hawaii, and they're looking at spending about $750 million to build that system. But it seems that we have a lot of throughput. We have the capacity to get in and out. But one of the things that we don't realize and we don't think about when we think about broadband is the latency issue. And latency basically is the delay or the length of time it takes to get from one point, from one network point to another network point. And in Hawaii, we've never really 
I guess to get anything in or out of Hawaii, we're always going to the mainland or we're going to Asia. The period points are currently there. Uh, we're trying to change that. Right now, we're in the process. We just got some power pulled in to a cabinet we have at DR Fortress. And uh, there's a company there that decided to take up part of the premise called CenturyLink. A lot of you know them as Quest. They're a tier one internet provider. So we have power put into a cabinet. We're putting in a new switch in there. And we signed a contract with them to do a tier one peering arrangement right in DR Fortress. So we moved that pier from the West Coast, where it normally was in Los Angeles, to Hawaii. And that should be active in about two weeks. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do to facilitate things is we're putting Ethernet network to network interfaces into all the carriers. And what that will do is now the carriers, Ethernet traffic that comes in and out, will be able to connect them at native Ethernet speeds right in their central office and bring it out and distribute it by a metro Ethernet network. And I think we're about out of time. Thank you. going to take you out of order. I'm going to get um, Keeman to speak so that we're kind of talking with all the, the um, technology providers uh, first. And by the way, if you have any questions, we're taking questions through Twitter. Again, the hashtag is 808speed. Uh, go ahead and tweet your questions with the hashtag 808speed. We're also taking questions by the index cards on your table. <laughs> I know it's not very high tech, so that, but, uh, but and people are going to we'll pick up those cards from you and give them to Yuka. And the idea is to give her more questions than she can possibly ask. Okay, so let's load her down with good questions based on these remarks. Now, Jay was mentioning thinking about me when he said uh, index cards, you know, old guys. <laughs> I never thought I would be the old guy. I've been around um, doing this telecom business for about 30 years now. I work for Whitetel. I went to telephone, PDE, PW Telecom, and now I'm with Oceanic. So I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot of the things change over the years. When I started, it was 75 baud. I don't know if you guys know what that is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Must be um basically yeah, anyway. I had to show one of them. Anyway. You know, and now there's there's speeds up at ten gig. Ten, ten gigabit. So it's come a long way. Uh, I've been on the broadband task force, so I used to torment David and I've been on some of the uh, working groups, so Broadband is something I'm really interested in, and and it's something really I think that can really help uh, the state and, and the country for that matter. So let me give you some of my thoughts, and they're really my thoughts, not time not Time Warner's thoughts or or Oceanic's thoughts. They're, they're mine. Okay. So first thing is there needs to be a demand for and a supply of good broadband for it to, to flourish. I mean, it's pretty obvious. The demand has to come from the customer. It has to be a customer demand or market demand. People want it, it'll happen. And so what are the drivers for this for this, this demand? So I'm going to throw out some information since we want to tell stuff that nobody is like really um, pretty public. But anyway, I have some information for you. So first of all, uh, if you assume there's a demand, then you need a cheap supply. Okay, so broadband, we're a broadband provider, Wintel, PW, we're, you know, we're all, we're all big providers here. So with all of us, and, and including um, the wireline, I'm going to show wireline because I can't speak too much about wireless here. I'm sure now I'm wrong. 95% of the, the the state is covered. You can have some kind of broadband. Now we're not talking about gigabit, but you can get in 95% of places you can get some broadband. Okay. There's only right now 60 to 70 percent of the households and businesses that subscribe to broadband. And um, of course, these things are, ser are served 
primarily by twisted pear or coax or some, and some wireless, but there's fiber, fiber is actually still fairly low penetration into, into the hook, okay? So one more thing, demand, the demand side is the speeds. Um, we have services from one and a half to 250, which they were the same. 80% of our customers have 10 megs or less. That's what they subscribe to. 80% of the people, I mean 80% of the people use only 20% of the bandwidth. And uh, of course, the, the vice versa, 20% use 80. <laughs> On average, downloads are 10 times more than uploads. And then how much of the types are being used to, to our customers? 50% on, on downloads, it's about 50% of what's being used, uh, what's available right now. On upload, it's even worse, it's 10%. Okay, so demand is is relatively in being used low. So now it's just trying to figure out how do we how do we pay for this? Do people really want this stuff? <coughs> Are they willing to pay what we can we can provide it for? So that's that's the whole supply and demand type of equation. We can build it at a, at a certain price, then um, will people pay for it? So that that's the, that's the hard part. That's the part that we've all been struggling with. Okay, lastly, did I, get my, did I give my word? My word was. My word was, where's my word? <laughs> <laughs> my word was, this is one word, customer demand. Put a hyphen in it. Oh, put a hyphen. So I think applications, we need more applications and people need to want this and then we'll build it. presentation so far because the Hawaii Broadband Initiative is divided into two sections. One is infrastructure, the other one is adoption. So the demand side, you know, growing the demand is extremely important. Uh, next I'm going to ask Eric to speak as Hawaiian Tampa. Hello hi everyone. It's great to be here. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, my one word, I'll start off with my one word, it's capital. And I hope my comments will sort of give you an idea as to why I believe that's uh, an important one word, because that's ultimately what it's gonna take. Um, you know, Hawaiian Telecom is a locally based, publicly traded, end-to-end uh, -end communications broadband provider. And I took over the company about four years ago, and I can tell you from the day I walked in to that organization, one of our highest priorities has been, besides getting through bankruptcy, <laughs> was really to increase the speeds of broadband, as well as to enable our customers through IP-based and managed services. Uh, and so this has been a very, very high priority for us. We absolutely believe and support the governor's vision of one gigabit of broadband. I think where I go off the ranch to use David's um, term is my concern is around time frame and affordability because it gets back to capital. But clearly um, a firm believer that broadband is critical to our ability to be successful as a community, as a country, uh, and to compete globally. No question about it. It is the most important connection that each of us have in our homes and our businesses that connects us uh, with the world. In the last four years, Hawaiian Telecom on average has spent over $80 million a year in our network and our systems to continue to improve our capabilities for our customers. And we're a $500 million property plan and equipment business, so it's a significant investment. It's 20 cents of every dollar that we generate on the top line. This is revenue, not profits. 
20 cents on every dollar has been invested. That's significant. Our peers across the country invest on average 15 cents of every dollar that they generate on the top line. So we have made a commitment because we believe that this investment is key to our future because if we can enable our customers, our residents, and our businesses to achieve what they need to achieve through broadband, we will be successful and our state will become more successful. The bottom line is that investment comes with a price. Okay? Capital is not free. Okay? It takes capital to increase the capability. And if you want to have access to that capital, you have to generate a reasonable return. Otherwise, you will not get access to the capital, or you may be able to get access to that capital, but at a price that's cost prohibitive. So at the end of the day, that's what it's going to take. And we have been fully committed to making sure um, that we make the investments that are necessary to address the customer demand that Keeman spoke about. Let me just address and hit some points which I think align to Keeman's points. We have increased our speeds. Uh, when I joined the company, it was 1.5, 3, and 7 meg was what we offered to consumers. We're now 3, 7, 11, 15, 20, 25, and in some places 50. But I will tell you that the adoption of the higher speeds is very low. Our statistics are very similar that about 80% are in the 11 meg or lower speed categories. So there's a demand adoption uh, issue. On the business side, uh, I'm sure this is the case uh, with PW Telecom is, we're already providing one gigabyte uh, service to businesses. In fact, there's some customers that have 10 gig. Okay. So that capability in dense business areas is already there. But those businesses are looking to pay for it. Okay, we should get back to an, uh, another point I made in the beginning, which is the affordability. So in the end of, at the end of the day, uh, we believe it's the right strategy to have an aspirational vision to try to get there as quickly as we can because that's what's gonna allow us to uh, be competitive. Uh, the trick to all this is how can we get access to the capital and deploy that capital in the best way possible across our state to achieve what we want to achieve. So um, those are my comments, and thank you for the opportunity again. Aloha. It's not every day we get to hear all those people in the same panel, so it's a great <laughs> opportunity. And I'm going to, as a transition, ask Brett to come up um, as he is a provider to the providers in some sense using wireless technology. So here's Brett. Hello everybody. Not a lot of people know about Blue Street Broadband. We're, very, we're known for a very small segment of here. If there's one word that I needed to use to describe the broadband in Hawaii, it would be dense. At Blue Street, our, our goal is to uh, act as a resource provider to other carriers. There may be fiber in the, in the street or going to a building that you're in, but across the street, there's not fiber in the building that your partner is in or a specific company knows. The cost that Derek has spoke to is, is there to create that connection. What we do is we wirelessly do those connections from 20 meg up to 10 gig, symmetrical speed. And then we have the, the carriers use our services to get to that area. It can be used as a redundant connection, as a temporary connection while fiber is being built. But understanding the density in a market is one of the most important things I think you have to do is to understand the broadband connections within the market. Um, the amount of bandwidth coming out of the urban areas in, in downtown Hawaii are very significant, as you know, we've seen. The amount of bandwidth coming out of the rural areas of Hawaii, however, are not. The cost of infrastructure to build out in those areas is very high. A lot of times fiber cannot be used to get there economically, so other technologies need to be used and adopted. 
the idea of using a single type of technology, understanding that fiber is the answer for everything, has to be reevaluated. Other technologies exist that can give us the same amount of broadband to these outlying areas without the cost of the fiber infrastructure. In some areas, they're more economical, and it's easier to get the capital to build out those areas. In some areas, it's, it's a better way of getting it done. Flooding density is a very important issue. As they stated, in the urban areas, we have gigabit services in a lot of places. Our company is providing gigabit services in areas where there's currently not the ability to get gigabit service. But it still comes down to the cost of the infrastructure. Even though you have a dense market, there's a lot of bandwidth there, it still costs more to provide more bandwidth. Um, we're not the same kind of carrier that the panelists are because we only supply services to carriers. So understanding the um, consumer market is not a lot more because our forte is understanding the carrier's market and what the carrier's ability to get services in are. I think that the density in urban Hawaii, you know, primarily Honolulu, is very well served. However, if you go out to Ever Beach, it's not served at all. So I think understanding the density is one of the most important things we have to do. Um, service provider and we often used to, to tell our staff we can only be as good as the, the telecom providers that we buy service from. So if they're down, we're down. So we can only be as good as the infrastructure that we're purchasing. And I think Nam can, um, with stack on it, can uh, tell us how the middle person um, being able to add services onto the internet for our clients um, can address this broadband issue. I am Nambu. I am the chief tech nerd at Shockinet. Um My word is delicious because that bread pudding was delicious. <laughs> 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 but really, my, my word is, is um, competition. Um, you know, we all want to cooperate, but ultimately, we're we're competitors in some sense. Um, we're probably definitely the, the smallest guy in the totem pole, not only the height, but uh, <laughs> the, the company also. So um, I'll, I'll just share with you a little bit of the challenges that we have um, had in the past. Uh, my wife and I own the company, and uh, in some respects, I, I uh, keep her non-technical as much as I can, because it, it uh, creates an interesting dynamic where she asks me why things can't be done. So. I'll throw out all the technical details because I, you know, I brought up those barriers for myself because I, I know about the technical details and then she'll go, well, why? And so it, it keeps me on my toes. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as competition is concerned, it's not, it's not, um, it's not always going to be, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that uh, are in play here. One of the things when we first started, um, we were really naive. Um, and so we said, well, you know, how do we get, how do we get uh, connection out to here? Well, let's just drink it up on the light pole. So we went around and asked her, you know, can we go on the light pole? No, no, can't do that. Why? Um, Hawaiian Hotel and Oceanic are on the light pole. Yeah, but we don't have procedures for, to let anyone else on the light pole. Uh, why? we just been working on it. Well, it's been 10 years and they're still working on it. So that's something at the state level that, you know, if someone would actually work on it, we could actually get space on the bike pole, which would then create a situation where the plane field is a little bit more level now. Um, you know, if we can't, if we can't distribute our, our wires the same way as, as the two main carriers do, then there's no way for us to really compete on that level. Um, so we said, okay, well, if we can't go on the light pole, let's just go on the ground. Um, no, can't do that either. Well, who owns, isn't there any um, shared conduit? No. Well, who owns the conduit? Cable, 
telephone. Okay. Well, why don't we just rent space in the conduit so that uh, I'm not picking on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so why not just rent some space? You know, they they are obligated to, to let it in, and uh, everything will be fine, right? So we said, okay. Well, I'll share you a little story. We we wanted to run fiber from one building to another building right next to each other, and. We said, okay, everything looks good. We're, we'll set it in motion. We're going to get it going. <coughs> Six months later, we find out, oh, the, the conduit's full. Um, but uh, there's not much in the conduit. Well, there's all these trunk lines. Well, they've been cut some time ago. It looks like they've been cut 15 years ago. Um, but we have to clean it up. Well, can we just clean it up? Yeah, but it's going to cost you umpteen thousands of dollars to clean up this conduit so that we can run this fire. So those are the challenges that we've got. And so ultimately, when, when we're having to buy our, our internet connectivity from basically the, the two main carriers, um, it creates a disadvantage for us. And where it really comes into play is when we occasionally run into the same project um, and bid on the same project, our cost for connectivity are often higher than what they're bidding um, for the same project. So there, there's really no way that we can compete when we're faced with that kind of cost structure and, and uh, challenges. So um, I guess I'm asking if there's ways, you know, as simple as someone developing a policy for for access to black um, You know, if it'd be great if we can build a uh, shared infrastructure where where. We're not forcing the guys to jump on, but if you want to jump on, yeah, you can rent out a piece of fiber uh, that's running off the state. So that's that's our challenge. And I don't know where this whole Maverick thing came from. So that was just to whet your appetite to get the questions going, really, uh, rather than for them to. Uh, go on about what they wanted to speak about. This is really a panel for you. Um, I just wanted to let you know that with the Hawaii Broadband Initiative, government is setting this policy, as, as David Lasner said. And I guess I'm using the internet tradition now of crowdsourcing. Uh, what we really need to do as a community, not just the role of government, but through the community. So uh, our questions will be sort of focused on not just what the obstacles are right now, but what are the solutions that you see, I mean, we have to rely on the providers to be able to provide the infrastructure. So what is it that's uh, preventing them from um, deploying it right now? And I think some of the answers we got was that they, maybe they don't necessarily see the demand. And I'm not sure if that statement sits well with the audience. One of the questions that got asked uh, was if, I think it was Stephen who said, um, Half of the, or was it half of the, half of the uh, capacity is being used, um, but we have 80% of households um, signed up. So, what's the discrepancy there? And um, if you could also comment on the usage, can you see the type of usage what people are using the broadband for? Maybe you wish can also chime in later on you wish this data what the, the academics are using the internet for. I understand the question, but I said it's um, eighty. <coughs> um, Fifty. Wait, which number you want? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Whichever the Computer. number is. Okay, eighty percent of of our um, Eighty percent of people use twenty percent of the bandwidth. You know, I think you guys not arguing that it's. I just uh, whatever the speed of our service is, on average, you it's only being used fifty percent. So there is some headway. I mean, it goes up and down depends on what you're doing and all that type of stuff. But on average, only about half of it, half of it's being used. So that doesn't. In, I think that doesn't yeah. include the fact that there's saturation at some time and then yes. there's no saturation. So obviously at maybe three o'clock in the morning, you have headroom. But Sunday night, 
Right, I'm saying that on the average, so yeah, maybe three o'clock in the morning, it's only 10% being used, and and as at a peak time, it might be a, yeah, 80, 90%, so on average. So um, what will be, oh, sorry, do other panels want to chime in on the, how about the usage patterns? Or what what's being used? Um, like, is it mostly for video as opposed to? Actually, we don't, we don't look at its data, I mean, it's, data on there, we look at the capacity, you know, how full it is, uh, so that we know when to upgrade different uh, segments and things. We don't really look at what, what it is. Maybe, maybe the follow-up question then is, um, I think the specific uh, figure that the user was asking was, only 60% actually subscribe when you have 95% broadband coverage. Could you maybe explain that to the audience? why that is? Well, what, what that fact is, is we can serve, I, I think it's, yeah, between Cointel and, and Oceanic, we can serve 95, at least 95, it's actually over that, 95% of the homes and businesses, which means that our cable lines are, are twisted pair or fiber are, are either right outside the house or in a building. Okay, and so if a customer wants to buy service, they can. That's a, 90, that's a 95 plus percent. The 60 percent is how many people actually do, 60 to 70 percent. And could you, um, I know Hawaiian Telecom also mentioned that there is a top um, service for 50 megabits right now. What is the pricing on that? You know? I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, oh gosh. I, the reason I'm asking is, is the demand low because they can't afford it? It's not the right price point? Well, you know, affordability, I, I think at the end of the day, what it gets back to Keenan's point, customer demand. So, so people are looking for value. And, and value to me is defined how much um, capacity do they want based upon what they can afford equals, I think, value as it relates to this. And so, you know, I'm gonna guess here, but it's probably in you know seventy nine, eighty nine dollars uh, a month. You know, one gig, as I saw in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I think Jay was the one that pointed out that it was like three hundred and fifty yeah. uh, dollars per month. And right. Sweden offers that for hundred twenty, so everybody knows. Um, the question is, how did they get there? Right? I mean, did the government subsidize it? Or did private en enterprise pay for it? Sonic.net is offering um, a gig for sixty dollars San Jose, right? Maybe uh, we could have some of the providers speak to the neighbor island coverage specifically because we believe that broadband of all the places within Hawaii, uh, broadband could uh, level the playing field for the neighbor island businesses and commerce as well as education and healthcare. Could you talk about the penetration of the neighbor island? Because you mentioned that 90% we have coverage, but I'm afraid that it's probably Oahu and the 10% coverage we I think don't that's have. Statewide. That's a statewide uh, statistic, and that was that was determined when uh, the feds was looking to um, dole out stimulus funding. And so uh, it was during that process is when I, I believe we collectively uh, concluded that, that we do have statewide coverage of 95%. You know, um, I don't know if that number uh, captures what the wireless providers are able to capture, but I can tell you in 2011, um, we built out almost 200 sites, fiber to cell sites across the state. And I know Oceanic did uh, a, a good chunk of, of sites as well. So I would, I, I would say in 2011, the access is probably greater than 95% than when you layer on top of that the, the wireless uh, capabilities. How many of you here are affiliated with neighbor island institutions? You just have one from several of the Is that kind of your experience, you feel? The, what's the question? What, oh, what do you, do you feel like that matches with your experience, the coverage on the neighbor island? It's, it's significantly greater now. 
I think we have coverage, but the kind of coverage is, is the, the key. And I, whenever we um, have gotten quotes for high availability or uh, high bandwidth um, on the neighbor islands, it's, it's twice as much, three times as much for the same bandwidth as on Oahu. So there may be um, coverage, but uh, like like the, she said, there's the quality of coverage and then the, the pricing of it has, has changed quite a bit. I, I kind of want to jump in on the, um, I don't know if, if I'll be considered agreeing, but I, I actually um, believe that Eric and Nam were saying something very similar, but from different positions which is that the capital costs are really significant. And again, back to the playing field, and, and you know, Nam described it pretty carefully, uh, what his experience is as a small entrant, that this is not an open market, really. It's because the barriers to entry, I, somewhere along the line, I got a degree in economics. Um, <laughs> the barriers to entry are significant if you are not an incumbent player. And there are lots of ways this plays out, and Nam lives it every day. Um, but even for Hawaiian Telecom, and I applaud Eric and his company for their level of investment, but realistically, we're working in a duopoly. Um, the demand for high bandwidth services is low because the price is relatively high. And you can reel off you know, Sweden, Lafayette, et cetera, Japan, it's about 30 bucks, I think, for 100 megabits, gigabits, symmetric services. Um, we are paying for both of those companies to basically install duplicative capital infrastructure. And so each of them is required to finance that infrastructure so that I have my choice between DSL or a cable modem. The places that are advancing, again, have figured out, to use uh, Nam's closing word, shared infrastructure. And that can be shared conduits. Um, in the places that really get it, it tends to be shared fiber. And the competition is not to dig up the street or pull fiber on the poles. The competition is to use that fiber to deploy innovative services at competitive prices with great packages and offerings. And that's where innovation really occurs, not at the, you know, who can install fiber the cheapest and pass the other guy and perhaps slow the other guy down because of the conduits or poles that one happens to control. Okay, maybe, um, does anybody else want to comment you, on that? Can I <laughs> add a little bit of, kind of a side thing to all of this? In addition to the capital, a lot of the things that I think holds us back is time. You know, we are continually trying to expand our network. We build fiber. I have a situation on the Big Island we've been trying to put in some new conduits, expand the network. We've been tied up for five months now, waiting for permits, uh, waiting for appeasement approvals. And this is common. Anytime you want to do a new build, you run into this in this state. And that kind of goes with the uh, Hawaii's a hard place to do business. There's a lot of regulations, a lot of uh, different agencies you deal with, all for the same thing. For the permits we need, we have to basically talk to three different departments each one taking their own time, each one giving us questions back, and we, we got to read the blueprints, we submit things, and we got a whole delay. So those things will add and add to our cost of capital, at which thereby adds to the cost we have to charge customers to deliver service over time. So um, I'm not sure exactly which part of them, uh, maybe commercial circuits, but in general for the consumer market, our prices are the same, basically the same for every island. So the, the way, you know, like Cliff and, and David said, some of those neighbor islands, it is more expensive to provide service because per how you have to run the fibers. For example, there are, there are places that are pretty far out all by themselves and you have to, um, get fiber a long way to, to get to those locations. So the, you know, if, if it was just taking all those costs and charging us for service there, it would be a lot more expensive than 
you know, in that location. So on average, we're, we're taking all the costs and averaging it out so that everybody can pay basically the same price. So um, there's my, I'm not exactly sure. How yeah, to we were looking for a 20 meg um, symmetric circuit and um, the pricing that we got was, was double. Yeah, I, I would just concur with what Human said and, and just so that people know, you know, we don't have complete flexibility in terms of what you charge, um, you know, wholesale, we're a wholesale, you know, provider. Uh, you know, we're governed by FCC uh, regulations in terms of what uh, we can set our prices at. So it's not like we're trying to price anybody out of the market. It's a, it's a cost-based uh, model. So um, let me a little bit change the tune of the, because I don't want us to be like why we're not doing broadband. I don't, I don't think that's what this panel is about. I don't think that's what the audience came to learn. Um, obviously, we don't have it as well as we can yet, so there are obstacles. So um, as David mentioned, you know, shared infrastructure would change the whole conversation about cost, uh, because right now we're asking each one of you to duplicate the capital cost. And so that's why you would have to incorporate that into your pricing, which again, I don't blame you for. But would you be, as telecom providers, willing to consider a different model that involves shared infrastructure with other telecom providers? And I ask this in public because <laughs> telecom <laughs> providers are notorious for wanting proprietary, you know, I want my hold or my um, antenna and there needs to be strategic spots because coverage can be a strategic advantage in, in rolling it out to the market. So so I ask you, would you be willing to consider a shared infrastructure approach? Look, I think if that is one thing that the government can do in a role that would greatly, in my opinion, uh, with my company, assist. If the common infrastructure we're putting, uh, conduits, poles, and we could just pull. It's the difference between three to five hundred dollars a foot to ten to fifteen dollars a foot. So you can see the dynamics and the economics of how that will change for the customer base as well. I I think you know my answer on that. I, I think that the infrastructure being shared makes a lot of sense. It's it's being done in, in many 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 other municipalities. Um, it's being done by the wireless carriers, um, and it's not something that the, the government is doing. There are two major um, cell tone cell tower companies that are building privately um, uh, built cell phone towers that are shared um, by the cell phone carriers, um, and they are just a neutral tower company, and they just rent out space on the towers. And so um, we we need to have. Uh, shared infrastructure so that uh, you know we, we're not duplicating and, and we can compete on a, on a level and playing field. I, I think the one thing that needs to be understood about a shared infrastructure is in concept I think it's a it's a noble idea. Um, in reality you have to understand that somebody's got to manage that infrastructure. Uh, besides the ability to get to a gigabit, you know you got to worry about the quality of that gigabit. So you know, one of the things that's very seldomly talked about is what's the service level of agreement that you're going into with the shared infrastructure. In the business market, you know, we have to provide a 4.9 SLA to our customers. Uh, redundancy, we've got to provide a 5. Out to consumers, they want to see a 3.9 SLA. In a shared infrastructure, how do you control the SLA that you're selling to your providers, to your customers, without controlling the infrastructure itself? It's almost an impossibility. So, you know, and, and you have some of that in, in between the islands with some of the shared fiber that goes between the islands now. You know, one company will own a portion of the fiber one, another company will own another portion of the fiber, the fiber break, who fixes it? Who, who deploys? Who, who takes the cost of fixing it? So those are all things you have to consider when we talk shared infrastructure. Can I add a cost point? As you can tell by now, I'm kind of into numbers. <laughs> A lot of the infrastructure will probably follow roads and highways along the same path. So if you look at Oahu, you have 5,547 miles of. So basically to build new backbone on that, it was total to about $2,858,000,000 to get that infrastructure built. 
if we were to look at a common infrastructure that's ubiquitous on a lot. Yeah, I wanted to comment. I, I think we've, we've talked about this before. Um, because, yeah, and, and on the surface, it does sound like a good idea. We can share it. And I think we've said, if there's a way to fairly do this, and it costs us less to do it, why wouldn't we want to do this? We would want to do it. But it's not that easy. Okay. <clears throat> we've uh, both invested, or we've all invested in our infrastructure already. And it's, we took the risk, we put it in and we own it now and so what i think we were trying to decide is okay we're going to share all this infrastructure so can we come up with a way that we can compensate our what we put in already and we can fairly share it all that, that the logistical parts of of uh, reliability and troubleshooting those logistical issues are actually pretty uh pretty big challenge as well who's going to monitor it where do you hand off there's a lot of logistical things uh, that that need to work be worked out in order to do that because it's not that we don't want to it's not a not an easy process to figure out would having a neutral broker to uh, be inserted in that conversation help you at all in accomplishing that well you have that you have the same thing with the permit with that when you go to an expedite for permitting but what that happens is, is now you have another entity that is having to generate some kind of revenue for being in that model, which by default increases the cost. Uh, just a couple of comments at that point, uh, on that point. Our good friends at the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, who is, where are they? Where are they, DCCA group? Oh, there you go. Um, they are legislated um, to convene the, the Broadband uh, Assistance Advisory Council whose main charter is to look at the permitting process right now and to revise it and provide uh, suggestions to the legislature. Uh, we do have uh, committee members and also uh, we can make uh, uh, comments, be, uh, we can solicit comments publicly um, so that there, there is a, a venue to work on that. Uh, second point, I've gotten so many cards, I can't even read them fast enough. And, and they're everywhere, the comments are all over from you know, is this more important than rail to, why can't we do everything? Why can't we do everything? Oh yeah, and then, and then we want to get into, yeah, the rail, I'm sorry, but you missed the rail event, what, two months ago? So, okay, but um, the, wi the Wi-Fi question, why can't we do everything by Wi-Fi? Um, I just wanted to clarify for people here, at some point, the Wi-Fi has to terminate somewhere. It has to get to a, a LAN cable, and so, um, obviously, uh, the, just so you know, the one gigabit is not the goal that the, it's set by the Hawaii Broadband Initiative. It's not a uh, technology-specific thing. We're not advocating for fiber to every every home. In many uh, re other regions, that may have been the case, but in Hawaii, we specifically made it uh, technology agnostic because it does make sense for some rural areas with weird terrains to have um, uh, you know, new Wi-Fi or at least wireless uh, technologies to, to be able to cover that. Uh, of course, the most reliable reliable way right now is, is fiber. I just wanted to, to mention those points so that the audience is wondering why we weren't talking about Wi-Fi. Um, so any other sort well, of comments I yeah, To the Wi-Fi comment, though, one thing you have to understand is there's a frequency problem in the U.S. as a global condition right now. If you, if you read the news at all, all the cellular companies are bidding for more spectrum. Um, one thing that very few people know is, is that over the next two to three years, companies like Verizon and AT&T and the big cellular providers are going to come out with what they call microsites, where you see that we're all used to seeing the big cell towers, but they're coming up with very small antennas that will go on the side of the building to serve that one little area. The other thing they're going to be doing in that is they're going to offload some of their spectrum responsibility to their own Wi-Fi which means in the next two years, you're going to see these microsites show up on the sides of buildings, and that's going to create interference for other Wi-Fi building or uh, Wi-Fi initiatives. So in the dense markets, it's going to become almost a useless technology because of all the interference you're getting in the area. So until frequency itself is expanded in the U.S., Wi-Fi is not a solution in, in urban markets. It can be in rural markets, but there is that obstacle out there. And Tara, am I getting all the questions through this too, or? Yeah, that's, I mean, 
the Twitter stream is blowing up. I, so yeah, so <laughs> great do your best answer. with what's up there. Okay. Uh, there are lots of questions also that the panelists may not be able to answer, such as hasn't Sandwich Isles used federal money to build high speed networks in the rural Hawaii? So can we leverage that with since it was built up with public money? I'm not sure if any panelists can address that. Anybody want to comment on? I don't think anyone wants to. <laughs> this is why I called you the Maverick. Uh, uh, what happened to the plan of using abandoned water mains, uh, conduits to save money? That's related to actually Sandwich Isles, as far as I, I understand. Uh, Sandwich Isles won the uh, bid, uh, which I think was held by the county, I believe. Um, for abandoned waterways to be used, and so I think they won that bid, and so they're going to be using some uh, public financing uh, loans to to um, use the abandoned waterways to to wire some places up. Um, I don't have the uh, details yet. We, I guess, next time we need to get some jobs people here. Um, related to the money question, exactly how much capital do we need, um, and uh, should Oahu be picking? back the cost of the neighbor island expenditures, and also can we use uh, revenue bonds to finance? So those are all sort of cost questions, obviously, and there's a lot more cost questions okay. amongst my many, many <laughs> cards. So yes, please, David. So, so um, <laughs> Cliff and I were just having a sidebar conversation about his numbers. So I've heard Verizon, which was investing, not in Hawaii, mind you, even when they were here, but was investing in a fiber to the premise service called Fios um, in, in, in some of their regions, but not all, and it dramatically slowed down that investment. Um, their number was something like $1,000 per household to get fiber there. Uh, we have, I think, 440,000 households in Hawaii, something like that. So <coughs> that's, that's uh, $440 million. Now, I don't really believe that number, so let's just double for Hawaii, say it's a billion dollars, let's throw in inter-island fiber, I don't know how much it would cost now, probably another 100 or 200 million to replace the system to all islands, um, and, and maybe it gets all the way up to this number, so let's say it's two billion dollars, so okay, we don't have to rebuild everything if we make the right sets of deals, so in Australia, when they decided they wanted a national broadband network, <coughs> it was very contentious between the government and Telstra, which was their incumbent carrier, and ultimately they came to terms about how to work together <coughs> to leverage what was there and build what wasn't. And they're, I think they're building out something like 92% of their households will get fiber, something like another 6 or 7% will get a high-speed terrestrial wireless solution, and their most remote will have to have a high-speed satellite solution because they can't even shoot any kind of terrestrial wireless. So I, I don't know what the numbers would be for Hawaii, but, but let's just say it's $2 billion. I love Peter's question. So if we, we're going to spend $2 billion, we're looking at $6 billion rail project, $500 million, And I'm not, I'm not trying to position it against it. All I'm saying is we have a $500 million plus inter-island power cable the reason we look at those things is because we think of them a different way. We don't ask where does the money for our roads come from, where does the money for our water system come from. We consider it infrastructure and we solve the problem. And we try and do it as affordably as possible. And that's the conversation that I think the people of Hawaii need to have. And then start marching on towards what's the right solution, how do we work with the private players, how do we introduce competition, um, at the right service level rather than necessarily at the infrastructure level. Great, thank you, David. Um, along those lines, okay, so I did some research myself. Um, another um, another contractor, Kate Calix, I don't know how to pronounce it, C-A-L-I-X. I think it's public knowledge that Hawaiian Telecom uh, retained them as consultants, so I know Hawaiian Telecom is very serious about fiber deployment. Calix is a, a, a fiber um, uh, equipment and uh, consultant, and they've done some numbers on the mainland where they, so those are actual numbers of deployment costs on the mainland, and 
I doubled that money because I figured everything in Hawaii costs twice as much. And I came up with similar numbers to, to David, which was about a billion dollars. Um, and then again, like David said, add maybe island cost, blah, blah, blah. Let's say it's $2 billion. Uh, I think I looked at the H3 highway construction. I mean, if you're really talking about the 21st century uh, infrastructure, uh, H3 was uh, 1.3 billion, I believe. So, you know, so, and how many of us take H3 versus, you know, broadband, which hopefully everybody will be able to use, um, save costs, all of that. So again, I think that's the conversation we should be having, not how much it is, but how can we get this done? And it's really a matter of when. Um, so, and I just wanted to also mention that uh, KIPA is doing a, a second version uh, of the study, infrastructure study, infrastructure availability study in Hawaii, and the second uh, edition, am I saying that right, second? The second phase. The second phase of that uh, KIPA study will include broadband as infrastructure. So, so broadband will be categorized as infrastructure in this study. So we look forward to that, uh, just to let the audience also know that um, the state received uh, federal grants uh, to figure out the mapping of how much uh, there is, uh, the deployment of broadband there is in Hawaii, as well as uh, having a statewide broadband plan. DCCA is currently overseeing that, um, and the Hawaii Broadband uh, Map, mapping.org, did I get that right? We'll have um, the data on what coverage that they, they see that we have. Um, <coughs> any other comments you can, there? Um, let me just add a couple of things. One is, um, you know, David, you talked about $1,000 to the home. Uh, just, just to add to that, um, you know, that's to get to the home. There's, there's an investment required to the core network. And then there's an investment required in the Trans-Pacific Inner Island cable uh, connectivity to handle and manage the bandwidth. So, uh, you know, if you, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about numbers to some degree because I, I was concerned initially that, that people didn't realize that we're really talking about billions, not millions, because we need to start with the facts before we can, um, you know, execute a plan uh, to reality. And so, you know, I think that's a real important thing. But we also, um, you know, not today, need to spend more time talking about the whole issue of adoption. Um, because uh, obviously, you know, the more bandwidth there is, um, you know, that tends to help all of us. So it's not something that I think the providers are trying to stand in the way of. It's, it's just that let's start with the facts and let's work on a plan to try to, to get that you know, together. And I think adoption will be, I think this, this panel was specifically structured for infrastructure. However, the next one, we could probably have one for adoption. We do have social media club. We do have the, the county's initiative, uh, county and city of Honolulu doing the open government uh, initiative. I, I think Sunny uh, also wanted to have state data be available publicly in a way um, comment, API, all of that, so that the public can manipulate the, the, the data or have applications, useful applications that can be used uh, by the public. So adoption is certainly a, a great question. So uh, just to summarize on the, the, that bit of, uh, last bit of uh, conversation, I just, because there's a question, would private companies prefer the system as it is or have internet made a utility all work together under one brand with government support fixed ROI? <laughs> I don't think that the, the government would be a good, um, good, good way to go. Um, I think that the government can facilitate uh, and I think that there are, are ways to make sure that... Is that, that uh, all known now? <laughs> I think that there's, there's ways of, of ensuring that there, uh, there is some kind of host neutrality. Um, but I do want to address the usage. If, if you guys have looked at the, the bandwidth usage in the world, or, or even in the U.S., for the last two years, the chart goes kind of like this, and then it goes like that. Mm -hmm. And so we're not talking about, about um, if it needs to be done. It needs to be done. It's just are we going to be able to react fast enough when the demand hits? Because it's already ramping up. I mean, we are seeing exponential 
um, increase in bandwidth usage. Um, and so, if we don't do anything, we're going we're going to be reactionary to to what the needs are. And so, if you look at the apps that are down the pipe, you know, streaming, obviously, uh, people storing everything in clouds, you know, people streaming from the clouds. Walmart just just um, brought out a project, a, a product where you, when you buy a DVD, you can put it on their server and then watch it anywhere you go. Well, that's not going to work if you don't have bandwidth to your iPad wherever you are. So that's where everything's going. Um, and so if we don't build it now, and it, it takes five years to build it, then you know we're going to be way behind. That's a good point. Uh, just studying the past usage is not an indication of future usage. As a matter of fact, if we project our infrastructure that way, uh, we're not going to be there. So uh, very good point. Um, I wanted to let the one of the themes of today is that we wanted to give you some information and thoughts that you may not have known. And uh, I wanted to let uh, ask David Lassner to speak a little bit about the, the broadband projects that are already on, on the way uh, that you might not know about. You may have heard a little bit in some uh, publicity, but maybe David could give us a more in-depth look on some of the projects going on already under the Great Broadband Initiative. We're up to uh, a couple things there. UA. Um, one is we were successful in obtaining some stimulus money, so we're working with um, Keenan Fine Company to get uh, fiber to every public school and every public library and every public higher education, community college, learning centers on every island. And we'll be lighting that initially with gigabit speeds, but it is upgradable. And part of the thinking about that is to um, begin to drive demand. I agree with the comments about demand, and we, we really do have to pay attention to that. What we're hoping is that if we start exposing um, students to gigabit speeds in schools, that they will go home and <laughs> and, Why don't we have this? And why can't I do what I can do at school at home? So there's sort of this split. Some of you will remember the um, the Monday after Thanksgiving, when it what used to be that nobody gets anything done at work because it's the busiest shopping day, and everybody's online at work uh, shopping because of higher speed connections in at home, <laughs> and that sort of flips a little bit over time. So that's, that's one project that we're really excited about. That'll be finished in uh, August 2013. It's a three-year project. <coughs> in a related approach to trying to help drive demand, uh, I'm involved with a national project called Gig U. Um, this is not a stimulus project, it's a group of universities that work together. And the premise is this, if you think about um, organizations like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, these things were all born on college campuses. And, and universities were actually one of the first places where we had unconstrained ethernet connectivity at high speeds, and then we'd all go home and on dial-ups back in the 90s and you know before these guys had the services they have today and so uh, working with the guy who wrote the national broadband plan here Blair Levin for the FCC he got this idea of, at the end of the national broadband plan which isn't really ambitious uh, certainly not as ambitious as the Hawaii broadband initiative he said how are we going to sort of crack this and begin to move forward with gigabit in some places. And he assembled a group of research universities. And we're trying to figure out how to get gigabit speeds to some university communities around the country. So UH is participating. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to pull this off with any of our partners. We don't, we don't want to build anything. Um, we would like to see gigabit connectivity around our university, but you know other university communities. And let's watch the innovation happen. And, and hey, said this to the Hawaii Broadband Task Force, if we don't have the speeds, we won't be developing the applications. Those will all be developed in Korea, in Japan, in Hong Kong, in Sweden. And by the time those applications are rolled out to us, it's going to be late to be building the infrastructure and, and, and watching the demand curve. So we've got to pay attention to both supply and demand together. Great, thank you so much. David, um, sorry. <coughs> Here's a wild and crazy idea. 
we have fiber running to all of the schools, all of the libraries. Um, what if we could use those locations at the pop and then run overhead fiber to the homes around the school, around the library? I mean, those are great areas now that that a company like ours did not have access to. Now we have pops in the community that we can easily run fiber from. Um, is that a possibility? Is that is something that could be built into the, the network? Um, anything is possible. Um, in general, the fiber that's being run is an extension of uh, what is called the institutional network. It's sort of complicated. We couldn't get a commercial deal, so we're not actually running that fiber ourselves. Uh, but certainly, the, from the, the uh, perspective of what the Stimulus Act was supposed to accomplish, the fiber is getting built out by a competitive carrier <coughs> who may or may not, you know, you know the drill as far as whether they'll sell it. But we're not in the position to sell it. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, that, that is how some other communities have leveraged the, the BTOP or the RL funds that the, um, public schools receive uh, to wire it up. I don't have any more time, so I'm going to ask the final question, which is that what are some short-term solutions? So whether you agree with the one gigabit goal by 2018, you know, don't complain about the timeline, don't, worry, you know, don't complain about capital, certainly please don't complain about the adoption because, like somebody said, you know, why are we complaining about the adoption? That's like what the private sector does, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, so I wanted to ask you, what are some short-term solutions to getting us started to get to the next step so that we all know we're making progress towards the one gigabit uh, goal? And, and I ask this because uh, an entrepreneur from, uh, uh, from the mainland uh, visited Hawaii and I think is residing in Hawaii now, said that Hawaii looks like there's so much excitement in Hawaii with uh, innovation and technology now that it reminded him of Portland, Oregon five years ago. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, thank you. I thought that was a great comment because it seemed like not a, a hype, like, oh, we're going to be the next Silicon Valley in two years. Uh, but that Portland, Oregon now is the mecca of, of uh, Silicon Forest. And this is what they're called now. And it's, it's coming with nanotechnology uh, institutions. It's, it's got a lot of software development going on. And in five years, that means that we have a chance to make it happen here in Hawaii. So I want to make sure that in five years, we actually become uh, as successful as Portland. And so again, to that end, what are some so short-term solutions we can see? So this is your ask back to either each other, to your bosses, to your board, to the government. What is your ask? What are your so short-term solutions that you can recommend? Ease of regulation would be one. Ease of regulation. Mm -hmm. So you're volunteering to, to work on that, right? Because that's easier <laughs> said than, I mean, we need to articulate that. Well, but it's, it's one of the biggest things facing any telecom with infrastructure. You have to get the permitting. You have to get the easements. You have to, you have to get the permits to put stuff in. And that's a, when that's as difficult as it is right now, it increases cost. So having the, you know, if the, uh, if we're looking at a community effort, the, the government itself has to be part of that community come back and say we need to ease these burdens as well on the carriers so they can build the infrastructure. Great. So we attempted that this year with some regulation and uh, be because it wasn't, uh, the wording didn't necessarily come from the private sector, we kind of had to guess some. I don't think the, the BAC committee uh, convened in time. So I'm hoping that, and, and as a result, I don't think we got much private sector um, interest or support in the legislature. So I hope that you will actively support uh, and be part of that solution in the next legislative session. Eric, do you have Actually, I was thinking the same thing. And I, and, and I guess I would say the working groups of the uh, Business Advisory um, Council is doing a lot of good work. And I think we should allow that to uh, continue, not as it relates only to the issues of permitting, but um, all of the issues that that were identified for the for the council um, to look at. So I think continuing that process will, will definitely be beneficial to everyone involved. One solution. Oh.
rolling on along that same train. <laughs> yeah, we just, we would like less roles. I mean, there's a bunch of roles, both FCC, state, and, and county. There's a lot of different roles for us to build in terms of, I mean, we have this beautiful system that we have, and there's lots of roles that restrict us from using it, I think, to the full potential. Um, DOCSIS, as maybe some of you know, is a, is a system where you can bond all the channels together to get higher speeds. Well, the, we can't use all those channels. We have to use it for certain things and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's my reduce re, reduce the rules. Um, I think just clarifying or, or developing some rules um, in some aspects, uh, such as the full access rules. Um, if we could develop those, and there could be possibilities that other players could run fiber on those. So open access, yeah. basically, yeah. on common infrastructure. I agree with everything. Nobody <laughs> so. picked permitting as the word. But uh, permitting is something that really holds us back. Right? But I think in the user group type of thing, we need to have a lot more conversations and communications with all the parties that can participate, that can bring value to, to what we're trying to achieve. I think one of the groups that is left out, and maybe it's a preference not to attend, but I don't know if they've been invited to attend, is the federal government, Department of Defense. Because here in the islands, they have a huge presence, and their infrastructure needs are, are quite large, and I think they need a place at that table to enter into the discussion with the rest of us if we're truly going to try and solve you know, the broadband and get to where we want to get. They are in contact with us, so you know that, yes, mm -hmm. they need to be in Well, they, they, they're kind of are in contact, but not in contact. Mm -hmm. you know, they're like <laughs> very quiet and behind the scenes. Perhaps it's time to have a little less, you know, a little bit more transparency and have them actively engaged in public events. I believe that our aspiration of becoming like Portland is worthy. I think we're well on our way. We have some great microbreweries here. <laughs> 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 right after that. Uh, Thank you. Great coffee. I think our coffees got ranked like uh, three of them ranked in the top ten or something like that out here. Um, so my final word, having moderated the panel, is, um, and I don't know this is like such as customer slash customer gas demand, it's not quite one word, but I think the word is integrative leadership is what we need uh, to move us forward. I thank you for your time, and this is not the end of the panel, as rather a beginning of a collaborative discussion. I am going to do my best to post at least all the questions that got posed, so that even if you didn't get answers to your specific questions, I think some of the answers addressed your questions. I'm gonna post them up at Gigabit Hawaii, which is against the face, again the Facebook page. Um, please visit that so that you can follow up on those uh, questions and what the answers might be, and I'll follow up with the panelists. I thank you for uh, this opportunity. I'll turn it over to Jay. Thank you, Mr. thank you, panel. Great discussion, and we had we had a huge number of questions that came from you guys, and uh, just as Yuka will answer them, uh, I'll set up a radio a radio uh, show on this. And we'll have a couple of you guys come down, and we'll answer all the questions if you if you dare. <laughs> anyway, um, now for some takeaway points from our favorite Spensation person, Bill Spencer, the king of Spensations, who is very good on takeaway points. Bill. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Well, um, you know, like. Like Keenan, I come from the world of uh, 300 baud modems, and then it was just a, a time where you could just hook it up to the plain old telephone system and, and operate over the over the telephone. Um, but then the 1200 baud modem came out, and you know it was a, going from 300 buck modem to a thousand dollar modem. This is back in the late 70s when I had my first technology business, the communication software business. And of course, there was no question once I saw a 1200 baud modem that I, I had to have it. And I, I think that's the key here with the adoption and demand equation that we're talking about. Because if people don't know what they don't know, how are they going to demand and understand the value of that high bandwidth? 
I mean, we've put up with, you know, YouTube choking along and <laughs> trying to catch up with itself. Because uh, we don't know, know better. You know, we've never seen what it could be like to have uh, a gigabit or even 50 gigabit. So I think, um, and of course, the more demand, the more people signing up, the lower the price. So that $150 can, or $300 can, can drop down. That's the economic part of the, uh, the equation. So I think my biggest takeaway is um, you guys as providers need to really help educate the public. I think David's program is going to be fantastic uh, to help the, the younger generation get it. Uh, but, you know, whether it's TV ads or the, you know, the trade shows you do or something, let's, let's show the public what that big pipe can deliver and really get them interested and excited so that they'll, they'll do it. You know, my, my wife and I share our our uh, one up, ten down in our house, and she's always complaining, Bill, it's so slow, what's wrong with my computer? And I said, honey, it's not the computer. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, to me, that's the, the main takeaway from all this. And, of course, permitting, I couldn't agree with you more. I've been through permitting hell the last five years. I, I know how that can really stifle progress, and, and I wish our, our governor's office folks were still here, but, you know, we got to do something about the permitting, and it's at the federal level, too. So. Thank you all so much. You've been a great crowd. Please, you guys, take your little bowl here. We're taking a lot of appreciation for being here. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on June 28th. We're going to have a legislative uh, wrap-up session. And um, hope you all can be there. We're also going to play a number of those interviews on network television. Uh, so you'll see how people all around the state feel about broadband. How much they know about it, how much they want it. Uh, their general uh, feeling about it. Okay, the, the program next month, June 28, is called. It's it's in in the vein of a legislative wrap up. It's called Speedy Relief from Tough Environmental Laws. You want amendment or you want exemption? Okay, we had plenty of that this session. Some of those bills passed, and some of them did. June 28, there's a blue ribbon panel for that. And of course in July, as I mentioned, we'll have filmmaking.